Good morning, church family, and welcome to our virtual worship service here at Chester United Methodist Church. My name is Josh Wortham, and I'm the director of music. We're delighted to have you join us today. I want to be sure you're aware that we are returning to in-person worship starting this Sunday, September 13th. If you'd like to reserve a seat for future Sunday services, send an email to rsvp at chesterumc.org. Let us know the names of the folks who plan to attend and look for the link on our website for the health form that needs to be completed. But for now, join us as we worship the Lord together in this virtual setting. And if you're able, stand and sing along at home to this first hymn. special message for you today. It's back to school time around these parts and whether you're going back virtually or in person, I just really hope school is going well for you so far. You know, I'm in school too and I get really excited about going back to school because sometimes I get to get some new school supplies. Let me show you some of the cool things I got. I got a notebook. I got some highlighters to help highlight my notes and my books. I got some new pens. Let me see what else I got. Ooh, I got some pencils, but I can't use this pencil right now because it's not sharpened. Let me see if I have another one. Here we go. This one has a tip. Now I can use this pencil to write or draw or help me take a test. You know, our lives are kind of like these pencils. God wants to use us in all sorts of ways to serve him and his people. But first, we must be sharpened for his purposes. And how can we do that? Well, one way we can do that is by through the sword of the spirit. And if you did Knights of North Castle Vacation Bible School, you know that this sword is actually God's word, the Bible. We can read our Bible to know how we're supposed to live for God. We can also use the power of prayer and that helps us build a relationship with God. And sometimes God will use other people to help sharpen our points by supporting us and guiding us in our faith journey. Once we develop faith and trust in God, God can use us to do remarkable things. It would be silly to sharpen a pencil and then set it aside, but when we use our pencils, it serves a purpose. 
Sometimes our pencils might get dull or break, but we can continue to use it, right? We just have to sharpen it. And just like we continue to sharpen our pencils so we can keep using them, we have to continue to sharpen ourselves. So we have to stay close to God and read our Bibles and love others and pray. And when we do this, we can stay sharp for God. Because without God, life is like an unsharpened pencil. It has no point. Will you guys pray with me? One, two, three. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity to go to school. Thank you for all the teachers and others who help us in our learning. Help us to stay, stay sharp so that you can use us to help build your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, friends, well, I'll see you later. Bye. Let's turn our hearts, our minds, our spirits to the Lord our God as we go directly to the throne of grace where we may find help in time of need. Will you pray with me? God, we are so thankful for your great love for us. We come here with honest hearts and we come sharing our lament and our hope. We lament our sins, that ways that we have been caught up in the systems of the world, the way that we have put our ego and selfish interest before the needs of others. We lament the way that we have been entangled up into various kinds of evil, and we lament the evils in the world. But we have great hope because we celebrate that through Jesus Christ, your Son, we have forgiveness. And we have not only the forgiveness of our sins, but the hope that through the power of the Holy Spirit that you are shaping us, changing us, transforming us so that we too might follow Jesus Christ our Lord and we might put away our self-interest, examine ourselves critically, and allow your Spirit to lead us to love for our neighbors, every single human being as ourselves, we lament, Lord God, that we find ourselves in the midst of a virus. We have hope because we know that through you, this too shall pass. 
We lament the loss of life to this virus and the loss of lives of some of our brothers and sisters recently in the church to different illnesses. But we celebrate because our lives and their lives are in you and they dance with you in heaven now. Their tears have been wiped away. They know no pain or disease. They know only joy and happiness in the Lord. We lament that not always have we been faithful. Not always have we loved every brother and sister in the body of Christ. We lament and we pray that never once will it be me or my brother or my sister in the church that will say, look, the church, the body of Christ, broken by me. But we celebrate because if we turn to you and keep our eyes focused on your son, Jesus, that we know that we will maintain our unity in the church. Even when we disagree, we can come together in love. We lament that we're not all able to be present in the sanctuary of our church, but we celebrate that some of us this day are there and that we are with them in spirit for where there are two or more gathered, whether in a place or through a virtual worship, we know that you are there. We believe and feel that you are with us. And we celebrate because we know one day we'll be together, all of us again. We celebrate because we know that we'll be with that great cloud of witnesses, all the saints and all of the Christians of all days. We lament many things, but we celebrate that you are always with us and that you are our hope. Therefore, we put all our confidence in you. We renew our trust in you. For you alone, God, and your Son, Jesus Christ, alone is our salvation. And so, Lord Jesus Christ, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
This morning's scripture lesson comes from the Old Testament, the book of Psalms. I'll be reading Psalm number 126. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter, our tongues filled with joyful shouts. It was even said at that time among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we were overjoyed. For the Lord changed our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in the desert waste. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. This ends our lesson for the morning. I've grown to love the Psalms over the years. And this one I think is very apropos for today as we are experiencing uh, in about an hour our first public in-person worship service in this sanctuary in a little over six months. I think it works for us on this Sunday because as I was looking up this uh, psalm and uh, praying over what to uh, preach about this Sunday. This psalm kept coming back to me because it is listed in our lectionary on three different occasions. Our lectionary, as you know, is a three-year uh, uh, way to read the Bible and preach on the Bible uh, in almost its entirety. And this psalm, Psalm number 126, shows up three different times. It shows up after Pentecost, which is called Ordinary Time, which is the season that we are in right now. But it also shows up in Advent and in Lent. So I was intrigued that this psalm could work in all of those seasons of our life. Some call it a, a call of lament, where the community is looking back at how they used to be. Some call this psalm as a psalm that calls for help, calls for help on the Lord. Some call it a psalm that calls for confidence and trust in God, and even a place for us to hope. The psalm begins with its first verse talking about dreaming. I dream a lot, do you? I often will wake up in the mornings and I think, oh, that was a wonderful dream, I've got to remember it, but by the time I make it uh, out of the bed and into the bathroom, I have already forgotten it. Dreams can be that way, can't they? Dreams are, are about uh, uh, thinking of some beauty that is happening around the world, or maybe it's about uh, thinking of someone you haven't thought of in a while. I am a dreamer in many ways. I love the creativity around dreaming about something. In my days where I would plan uh, the vacation Bible school, dreaming about what that would look like uh, in the summer months was just a glorious time of visionary thinking for me as I, I started thinking creatively and imaginatively of how can we bring the Bible story to life. Dreaming, it is something I do enjoy doing. The Bible is full of dreamers, did you know that? Think about the stories and the people that you remember dreaming in the Bible. There's Joseph. Joseph from the Old Testament, one of the 12 tribes, you know, son of Abraham. He had a lot of dreams, didn't he? And some of them got him in trouble. Some of them got him sold as a slave by his brothers uh, all the way down and to Egypt. And then when he was in Egypt, there were some dreams of Pharaoh that he was able to interpret and to name how God was working through those dreams. 
There's another Joseph in the Bible. In our New Testament, we know him as the uh, husband uh, to Mary, who is the mother of Jesus. Joseph of the New Testament had dreams, and in his dreams he heard God speaking to him, and he knew what to do to take care of Jesus. We have dreams in the New Testament again with Peter as he was uh, learning from God that, uh, you know, who God says is holy and acceptable needs to be acceptable to Peter, for he didn't want to include the Gentiles in the early faith. But God said, yes, let them be. You know, dreams in the Bible weren't always just uh, that fondest hope or the recollection of things uh, going on in our lives. But as James Howell puts it, he says, dreams in the Bible are often a cracking open of the as yet unseen future so God's people would know how to proceed, how to trust, and how to live together in hope. How are you dreaming right now? What are you dreaming right now? And how do you see those dreams as a way of God cracking open the yet unseen in this world? We've got to remember that God is a God of mercy and God is a God of justice. And so I hope at the heart of your dreams, mercy and justice and love are there. This scripture that I read for you also reminds us to remember. The third verse says, Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we were overjoyed. And we can remember those times of of God doing great things for us. God is still doing great things for us. As you look at your life and as you remember your life, where do you see God working? Where have you seen God in your daily activities? One of the places that stands out very strongly for me that has been a uh, kind of one of those markers in my life When I just started my senior year of college, I had just gotten settled in, in my dorm, or in my apartment, actually, in my apartment. I had just uh, returned to my job at the church where I was working at, and I received a phone call that said my father had had a heart attack, and he had been taken to a hospital. He had been flown to a hospital in the town where I went to college. I was the first one on the scene in the hospital, uh, and there was my dad, my rock, with all of those tubes and wires uh, connected to him. He was uh, asleep, and I come into that, uh, that hospital room. And I remember I was there for what seemed like uh, two or three hours by myself. I'm sure it was just an hour and 15 minutes because that's Uh, the amount of time it took for my mother uh, to drive from our hometown to my college town. But I remember that whenever she got there and she could see uh, the worry that I had on my face and she said to me, you know, Clara, God has been with us. God will be with us now. And what is amazing to me that as I look back on that time and as we experience life a little bit more, I realize uh, from the story that uh, came to me later that my dad, in his time of his heart attack, he did have a heart attack, um, he was going through uh, bankruptcy. He and mom were at a place where, uh, you know, uh, if the heart attack might not have happened, might not have happened, they might have been divorced. Uh, And my mother says to me over again, uh, she would say to me, you know, God was working in our midst in all of that. I remember that time not in nostalgia as a time that I want to go back to and experience again, but I do remember that time as a, God, as a time that God was very much 
working in our lives. Where do you see God in your past? Because if you can identify those places of where God has been in your past, then it's easier for us to recognize how God is working right now in our lives. What great thing has God done for us and through us here at Chester? If we look at our past and we see all of those wonderful ministries that we've been able to be a part of, those wonderful times that we could just know and experience God's Spirit right among us, then it is easier for us to be able to identify God working here and working right now. See, remembering is not about just looking back at those good old days and wishing we could have them back right here, right now. But it's about recognizing God. Remembering helps us recognize God here in our midst right now so that we can get a glimpse of how God is cracking into our future. What great things has God done for us and through us here at Chester United Methodist Church? This scripture that I read also uh, reminds us to dream, reminds us to remember, but it also reminds us that there is a sense of restoration that happens. Verse 4 says, The Lord changed our circumstances for the better. And then it uses two images that really pulled me to this scripture. One was that of a dry stream in the desert waste. Those are wadis, and if you've ever been uh, in a desert in its dry season, you know just how crackling, dusty that looks. It also uses an image of, uh, of a garden. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. You see, what I'm seeing here is that God is a God of restoration. And we know that because we see that in Jesus Christ. But God is a God of restoration that likes to share that with us. And so here, the tears that are cried becomes the shower that waters the garden. I am a very amateur gardener. Uh, I'm not all overly good at it. Uh, I don't get uh, reaps uh, or heaps of produce from it. Um, and, you know, as a matter of fact, I mostly get surprises from my garden. But I'm the one that goes out there with my husband and we, we work the ground. We plant the seeds. We watch them grow. We water them if we need to. We haven't needed to this year, but we water them whenever we need to. And then just the joy of seeing what comes up. And what I say joy in that, that is a joy. This year, I planted a whole bunch of different seeds in the ground, and not one of my peppers made it. Not one of them, and I don't know what happened. Uh, so all the peppers were, were gone. But in its place was this vine that was growing. And I thought it was a cucumber vine, so I was stringing it up like I do my other cucumber vine. But do you know it's not? It's cantaloupe. I have five melons out in the garden now, and I did not plant the cantaloupe seed. Must have come from my compost that uh, I didn't compost exactly correctly. But... What a joy it is for me to see those cantaloupe. You see, God will take our tears and God will use those tears as beautiful showers that nurture, that can nurture the world into a place that can bring joy and that can bring harvest. You see, restoration with God, though God does do the, the, the main work, in Jesus Christ, God asked for us to participate in the restoration through our discipleship. Each one of us are disciples of Jesus Christ. And because of that discipleship, we have some work that's cut out for us. So I'm hoping that in this scripture that we read this morning, 
that you can say with me that God is doing mighty things for us, that God is changing the circumstances that we are experiencing, and he's turning these dry streams into waterways that are gushing with water, that carry life-giving water. You and I have felt some dryness but you and I are the, are the tears that can nurture the water so that we can come home with joyful shouts and we can even carry bales of grain. I hope that in this time together, that as we begin and continue to open up to in-person opportunities, including worship, that we can experience the remembering of how God has worked in our lives and through our church so that we can be beacons of hope and that we can carry God's love into the world. I invite you to go from here, from wherever you are worshiping, and go carrying God's love dreaming about the possibilities and letting God come into your thoughts and into your hearts so that you can go out into the world. Go in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.